Like most elite sports, cricket at the highest level is a test of mental and physical toughness. When the chips are down, it's also a measure of resilience and fighting spirit. So when a young cricketer with big ambitions found himself in the biggest test of his life, he had the ideal grounding and everything to play for. This place, this used to be home. It housed all of my dreams. But it was all taken away from me in an instant. Many young cricketers dream of wearing the Proteas green and gold and playing on the world stage. Up in the air, soft as missile, easy as you like. For Solom Zinweni, his dream was to follow in the footsteps of cricketing icons like Jacques Cullis and Makaya Ndin. Studied the greats. I used to watch videos before training. Obviously, I wanted to play in South Africa at the highest level, go to a World Cup, win a World Cup. When did you know that you were good? When I was around 15, 16, I started getting selected for certain teams and camps and on a national level where you're training pretty much with the top 30 players in your age group in the country, you know, and, and you're holding your own. Someone else to come and bat. Mweni would excel with the ball, playing for the Eastern Province cricket team and representing South Africa at the 2012 Under-19 World Cup in Australia, before going on to play first-class cricket in Scotland. But on the 15th of July 2019, his life would change forever. That day was the day of the Cricket World Cup final. England was playing against New Zealand. On the Sunday morning, I noticed that as I was making my coffee, my grip on my coffee mug uh, wasn't the same. It just felt a bit weaker than, than usual. Fast forward one or two hours, as I want to get up off the couch, I'm, I'm realizing that I actually can't. And I literally said these words. I'm like, I'm sure I'll wake up tomorrow and everything will be fine. But he wasn't fine. Around 2 a.m., I need to go to the bathroom. But now at this stage, I've deteriorated even further and I'm even weaker. Fighting, fighting, fighting to get up off the couch. And subsequently, I like roll up and I fall on the ground. And I think this is the first time I started panicking. And I was like, okay, something's wrong here. And I just start screaming. So I had to do this combat call like thing to try and get to my phone. Literally, as I try and reach my phone, my fingers started going. And I couldn't like type properly. I had to like tap like, tap like this. Mweni managed to reach his phone and called his roommate before losing consciousness. That was the last thing I remembered before then, waking up in ICU. Only my eyes moving, whole body shut down, tubes everywhere, machines everywhere. He was diagnosed with a rare autoimmune disorder, Guillain-Barre syndrome. Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, is a rare condition where your body's immune system attacks your nerves. Weakness and tingling in your hands and feet are usually telltale symptoms, but that can quickly spread, eventually paralyzing your whole body. Though the exact cause of GBS is unknown, most people eventually make a full recovery. But Mweni's case was severe. For six months, he would fight for his life at the Aberdeen Royal Hospital in Scotland. This was the greatest test of his life. As a result of the bad state I was in, secondary illnesses started coming out. So, for example, I got tuberculosis. My liver and kidney failed, so I had to go on dialysis. And then that's the point where they pretty much put me on, uh, uh, in an induced coma. I would actually never forget walking into that room with my mom and dad. Like, my dad was broken. Sure. For the Nguyeni family, this was a trying time. His aunt, Nomkita Nguyeni, recalls the hardship, especially for Solomzi's grandparents, whom he had a close relationship with. I need that smile. I want to see that smile, so. Seeing Solomzi hooked up to every possible machine that you can think of. And he was whatever. not looking good. His mother, Zandile Nguyeni, was devastated. As a mother, mm -hmm. grandparents, mm -hmm. when they see that, mm -hmm. It's an unnatural mm. way 100%. of you to see your Absolutely. grandchild or your child. child. No, Absolutely. Guys. I cried, then I walked out of the ICU. I went into the toilet and I prayed to God because I was like, I never expected this reality. Mm. You know, sometimes there'll be days where I'll be like, can I exchange because this, I can see this pain. So maybe I can trade places yes, with yes. him 
so that, you know, he doesn't have to go, you know, through this. Despite doctors' fears, he pulled through and after six months was given the green light to return home and continue his recovery. His aunt, Zindatu Mweni, oversaw his repatriation. Throughout the rehab journey, you celebrate all your wins. Part of that excitement of, yes, finally, you're coming home. But it was hard because you think about so many things because, you know, he can't sit long for more than an hour. The flight is going to be two, two and a half hours. How do you prepare him mentally for the physical pain that he is having? I traveled with a doctor and a nurse and they literally had to transfer me onto all these different, like this chair, onto that chair, into this ambulance. It was very uncomfortable. But I did realize that me leaving the hospital was one step closer to me recovering. A professional athlete understands and accepts the rigorous training regimen required to perform at their best. It would be in Solomzi's journey in recovery that he would have to train harder than he ever had before. Mweni had to relearn simple tasks like sitting up, walking, and even swallowing. I struggled for a long time. I was depressed for a long time. But then at some point along the way, I just realized that that mindset was like holding me back. It was his steely determination and a dedicated rehabilitation team, which included Haley Khos, that helped him progress. When somebody first comes and sees me with GBS, they have muscle wasting and atrophy from head to toe. In Solo's case, we started on the bed, we did transfers in and out of the wheelchair. We also did a lot of functional stuff to start off with, so sitting and standing. And then we moved on to his walking and his balance. He was a good patient, which I think definitely came from his sporting background. So we did have to push a few times, but he managed to carry on pushing and carry on working through, and he always worked hard. His physiotherapist was Sharon Maritz. Do you remember any of your small or big wins in your journey with Solo? The first time he walked was quite amazing. He was in a harness, but he was upright and he was moving his legs on his own. I just had my hand at his back. Those are big things for a physio. It's amazing to see that kind of thing. Documenting his recovery on social media, thousands of people around the world keenly followed his progress. Why did you choose to share your journey so publicly? The more I shared, the more positive, positive energy came out of it. And the more I was like, oh, okay, got so many people supporting me and, and rooting for me to get better. I actually can't let them down on the days when I don't feel like going to therapy. I actually have an obligation now because it's not just me, it's not just my family, there's other people that are interested in my recovery. In solo, I saw a bit of myself. Businessman Peter Gerard, who was also recovering from GBS, was inspired by Nguyeni's journey. The two instantly formed a friendship. I keep telling him he must throw these bloody sticks away. He doesn't need a stick anymore. But he's a youngster who's, you can see he's been through a lot of stress and he's got the, um, the oomph in him to get over it and just get on with life and not worry about that. I'm overwhelmed and humbled by the fact that people care about someone we love so much. Like that's what connects all of us, that you're able to watch a story where someone stacked against him all the odds and he rose and it's, it's a beautiful triumphant story. We've also grown from Solomon's resilience and strength. We feed off that, you push because he pushes. Solomon's courage because he had the will and determination to want to get better. At times he didn't believe it himself, but there was just an inner fighting resilience thing in him. Determined, resolute and unyielding, Solomzi's road to recovery has inspired many across the globe. And although he will never realize his childhood dream of playing for the Proteas, he hopes his journey holds lessons for others. I think maybe towards the end of my life, I'll be able to understand why this happened. If something good and positive can come out of this, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing to go through. And maybe my story will be someone else's survival guide on how to navigate difficult times. Thank you for watching our stories here online and please subscribe below to become part of our YouTube community and be notified when we upload our latest content.